Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, arrives at London's Royal Opera House in Covent Garden for a royal performance. But this is not at all what you might expect. It's not opera. It's not ballet. It's not even on the stage. It's a fashion show. The first ever to be held here. A show designed to present what Britain's top dress designers can offer the women of the world. But in such a setting, it's hard to keep ballet out altogether. Each of these dancers is a ballet character, and each wears a costume to represent a fashion accessory. Shoes and stockings, silks and leathers, knitwear, gloves and jewellery, furs and hats. There's no fashion extra left out. Among the dancers is Firebird. She wears a foundation garment made by one of Britain's biggest corset firms. A foundation is designed mainly on the model and hand molded to ensure that it fits in all the right places. Belts and brassiers are a substantial fashion export today. They are mass produced in the factory when a design is completed. Controlling the feminine form has become big business, a business that is now highly mechanized starting with the cutting machine, which cuts out a hundred pieces at a time. The sections of the belt are sewn together at top speed. The suspenders and the ornamental stitching are put on in one operation. The zips are sewn in. And in about 20 minutes, it's ready to wear. It can be a long job from the original design to the finished dress, especially if the garment is made by hand in the salon of a top designer such as Norman Hartnell. A dress for a fashion show is modelled from the start on the mannequin who will wear it at the show, and the designer is there with the fitter as the dress takes shape. The top designers naturally cater for the individual woman with the big dress allowance. But Britain's largest chain of fashion stores produces millions of clothes of every kind, mostly for the other end of the buying public, in Britain and more than 20 other countries. Today they export thousands of brassiers as well as outer garments to Italy, France, Switzerland and many other parts of Europe. Britain's mass production of fashion is establishing a reputation on the continent for good workmanship and value. But before you can sell fashions in any quantity to a country such as France, herself the acknowledged home of fashion, you must show the French buyers, usually on their own ground, what you have to sell. These model girls are off to Paris in the spring to show the combined wares of 28 firms who form an export group, the Fashion House Group of London, to buyers from all parts of Europe, the Commonwealth and the United States. Since it was formed in 1959, the Fashion House Group of London, which specialises in ready-to-wear clothes, has steadily boosted its export figures, which now amount to more than five million pounds a year. Today, British fashion exports are up to about 11 million pounds. They have more than doubled in the last few years. In this factory of one of the group's members, thousands of dresses are produced for women of other countries each year, as well as for women at home. Today, the world is full of imitations. This girl, in a thousand pound ocelot coat, is starting off a fashion show with a difference. Almost everything in it isn't what it seems to be. This coat, for instance, isn't ocelot, but dyed lamb. 
while this one is made of rayon fur fabric and costs about 20 pounds. Here's a Persian lamb coat worth hundreds. And here's a fur fabric copy selling for 35 pounds. Even the bag and shoes are not what they seem. No crocodile ever wore those skins. They're embossed leather. Man-made fibers come in many guises, like this warm-looking woolen dress, which is really terrelene. Or this gay, cool, permanently pleated cotton. That's terrelene too. Since the dawn of time, women have been dressing themselves up in the skins of animals. They're still doing it today. Of course, the cave woman didn't have this sort of look. Nowadays, skins, particularly of cattle, goats and pigs, are made into leather of many different kinds. But most of the leather used for clothes comes from sheep. Mink, of course, is the thing for a night at the opera. Today, skins come in colours to flatter the wearers. And no matter how big or small you may be, there's a skin somewhere to fit you. At a show of ranch bred mink and chinchilla in the city of London, furriers come from all over the country to look and to buy. And points are weighed up carefully by the judges, just like at a flower show, before they award the prizes. This is Canadian wild mink, and about 120 perfectly matched skins will be needed to make a full-length coat. By the time it's ready to wear, four people will have worked on it for four weeks. This makes an acceptable present for any woman. At £7,000, it's one of the most expensive fur coats in the world. Even today, very few fur animals are bred on farms. Most are trapped in the wild. On the whole, there are so many available that trapping is no threat to the species. But Australia's koalas were almost wiped out to make fur gloves in the early 1930s. Polar bears almost died out in Alaska until the United States protected them by law. But today, it's the spotted members of the cat family, such as the cheetah, that are in most danger from the fashion hunters. Leopards are legally protected in many parts of Africa, but trappers still shoot or trap 50,000 of them illegally every year. So the slaughter goes on. One day we may find, unless we really do something about it, that these species will have completely disappeared. hundred years or more, men have had a horror of wearing anything which might make them conspicuous. Just look at the lengths they go to in the city. Even when the British male dresses up for an occasion, he restricts himself to toppers and tails in sombre colours.
there's always, of course, the pioneer who sets his own fashion. But today, there's a new spirit abroad. Slowly but quite perceptibly, men's clothes are becoming more individual. Ideas which may have started in Pall Mall are taken up by other sections of society. Army service, holidays abroad, these have given some men new ideas too. And women have had quite a big say. A trip to the seaside used to mean a pair of old flannel bags and a tennis shirt. But today, you have to have a special rig if you don't want to be a figure of fun on the pier. Some fashions haven't changed a lot. This London hat shop goes back more than 200 years, although the unsold merchandise in the windows is definitely post-war. Napoleon's War. To get the fit exactly right, they use a machine called a conformator. At first glance, you might imagine its function was to make the head conform to the hat, but in fact, it's the other way around. The steel pins mould themselves to every bump or depression in the customer's cranium, then prick out a record of their findings on a card. More men than ever are paying regular visits to the hairdressers. Half the barber shops in Britain cater for men, and they vary in style every bit as much as the women's, like this old established and dignified Mayfair salon. Or this hairdresser's in Hounslow, Middlesex, where you can have the same sort of treatment that women get. And of course, one or two purely masculine things as well. You can have your hair permanently waved or straightened. And while you're drying, you can have a manicure. Trimming eyebrows is all part of the service. Today, more and more people are becoming color conscious to achieve an effect and not necessarily to hide gray hairs. This house, set in 20 acres of fashionable Berkshire countryside, is the house of Raymond, still known as Mr. Teasy Weezy to millions. With it go a string of racehorses, a London flat, and a villa in the south of France. There's always room at the top, and these youngsters know it as they spend two years training at the London College of Fashion, run by the Greater London Council. Always ready to encourage up-and-comers, Raymond is an honorary governor of the college. Among the hair set, wigs are playing an ever-increasing role, and the college lays special emphasis on teaching the arts of weaving, knotting, and ventilating. With wigs, of course, a woman can speedily change her hairstyle for the different occasions of the day. Rosalie Ashley shops in her own hair. Friends in for coffee, and a fall is added, placed on a headband and worn like a hat. A lunch date completes the move from simplicity to sophistication. Cocktails call for a change of color as well as style. And for the ball scene, on goes the kitchen stove. But you may not be the center of attention if Raymond partners you. He's got his false eyelashes on. And another man who's been in the van of this revolution is Vidal Sassoon. Sassoon himself works at tremendous speed and with an infectious enthusiasm that animates everyone who works with him. He may change his styles as he makes or follows the fashions of the day, but the basic cut does not change. 
It is deceptively simple, until one realizes that it can take a new stylist two whole years to learn. One of the hallmarks is the glowing health of the hair, which can be largely due to correct cutting. The cut is always with the natural growth of the hair. Whether symmetrical or asymmetrical, shape must always be a basic principle. When hair is properly cut, say the experts, the owner could dip her head in a bucket of water without any ill effect. The hair will simply fall back into its correct shape. Another advantage is that, however the hair is styled, the client has only to brush it through for it to immediately revert to the original. Now the style that this girl has is So sorry, sir. Sometimes it takes two to create a style. Well, she seems to like it. A fine style for a party anyway. And a party is what the girls are wigging up for. Each of these wigs take more than eight hours to cut over a period of two to three days before perfection is reached. And each will cost from 100 to 140 pounds. Swinging party, some swinging hairdos. You made me dizzy, Miss Lizzie, when you call my name. Whoa, baby, yeah. You say it by me, you say Shoulders back, get a swing in it, keep the smile going, that's it. Ah well, it's a hell of a life being a model girl, but it has its points. There must be about a thousand of them in London alone. You know, anyone who thinks modelling is all glamour, or that the catwalk is a shortcut to a rich marriage, had better forget it and stick to typing. For one thing, the rich aren't what they used to be, are they? The fact is that the life of a model girl is in some ways like that of a primitive savage. Rough, tough, and usually short. No union asks for the model girl. For her, it's any time, anywhere. Tired or not, she'll be expected to smile, and smile, and smile. It's no wonder that most girls want to get that model look. Nearly every girl wants to be a model these days. But in fact, only a few have the necessary equipment. For instance, unless a girl has hips 35 to 38, waist 23 to 26, bust 33 to 37, and height 56 to 59, she may as well save her time, money, and tears. Responsible modelling schools only accept girls they think have the basic qualities for success. Lift up and down. Now I want 
want you to bounce from side to side and right and left. To scores of girls who aren't blessed with the right statistics, the model school classes are like a finishing school. Though they may never make the grade as models, they come just the same to develop the flair and get the with it style. Now, and stretch and push and out. The ones who do succeed can really get jet propelled. 50 pounds odd a day in London is bottle tops compared with what a girl can earn in the international model set. Into the dressing room, on with the war paint and into battle. One more big show for the cash customers. Some of the shows are so elaborate these days that they need days of rehearsing, almost like a floor show. Short cut to the altar. Don't make a girl laugh. It might spoil the makeup. Ah oh well, the check's good looking anyway. They say London swings. It doesn't. Not even the King's Road, Chelsea. But here and there, among the conformist, fat cat crowds, is a lean cat or two, looking like it might swing, given some encouragement. And in among the chain stores and supermarkets is here and there a shop that may have something all its own to say to the character who can send up the mass production car, to people who can put living before a living. World's End means where the King's Road ends, which shows what the King's Roaders think of themselves. Granny takes a trip, the shop behind the face calls itself, and it's typical of the non-typical, conforming to the non-conformist image of the inn, what they used to call way out, and before that with it, and before that groovy, and before that hep, and what Granny herself would have called the very latest thing, my dear. In this King's Road that London is lumbered with stands, just, a collation known as the Antique Supermarket, and antiques can mean clothes. This lady's time machine is headed for the flapper world of the 20s, doubtless a trip many a time traveller would love to take. One way of saying no to authority is to parody it. Some of the young, with little to say yes to, come to Soho, that pulsating heart of swinging London where girls join clubs to see old men strip. Or is it vice versa? And at the cutely named I Was Lord Kitchener's Valley, buy uniforms of the past to affront the uniformity of the present. In Carnaby Street, you can't tell the assistants from the customers. Anybody addressed as madam would probably sue for defamation of character. John Stephen, these are his shops, is the uncrowned king of Carnaby Street. Many of his business rivals would dearly like to see him crowned. The return of the dicky, for the man who can't afford a clean shirt but won't admit it. Op art spats, ideal camouflage for the larger foot. Once upon a time, just a year or two ago to be precise, fashion originated in the haute couture salons of Paris, then spread downwards through society in ever cheapening copies with one predominant theme. Shops such as this would have interpreted the mode, but no more. Now they originate, and so do a dozen others in a dozen styles owing nothing to Paris or anyone else. What gear the cats are wearing is one story, where they wear it is another. But whether here at Tiles, 
or here at the Bag of Nails, or at Samantha's, or George's, or the Saddle Room, or any of the ingaffs where they go, just don't take any of it too seriously, or you'll miss the whole point.